the derivative sine is cosine. Yeah, that is positive cosine. Oh. All right, see even more trouble? Yeah. Maybe we can see both boards? Yeah. All right, so real quick, have a conversation with somebody near you, please, about two things. Number one, how do you read that notation? Number two, what does it mean? Stephen? That's the answer, right? You're oh. so good to me. Thank you. Okay, uh, still, the conversation is... What does that notation mean? Like, how would you read it? And what does it mean? Just take one minute, somebody near you. Uh, <laughs> All right, I've heard it at most groups. This represents the definite integral of f of x with respect to x from x equals a to x equals b. Like, this is how you say it. This is how you properly say it. Now, in our time together, we're going to start using some shorthand. Sometimes I'm just going to say, oh, it's the definite integral of f of x from a to b. I'm going to forget. At some point, I'm going to stop saying with respect to x. Because the important thing is the function and the inference. Other teachers say it different ways, but the best way would be f of integral of f of x with respect to x from x equals a to x equals b. What does it mean? Let's get some hands on this. What does it mean? Is it one out of eleven? I'm worried. Two, maybe three. What does it mean? What is it that you're looking for, Stephen? What are we looking for? Uh, the area under the graph. In between. So it's the area. It's the bounded area. Bounded by four things. I need to get all four things. Stephen, give me one of them. Uh, the vertical line and the x values. The vertical lines of the x values. Okay, I asked for one. You give me two. You're an overachiever. Okay, the vertical lines, x equals a and x equals b. These are two of the bounds. There's another one. Myra? The graph of f of x. The graph of f of x. Polymon, what's the last one? No, there's one last boundary. One last boundary. What I heard is we've got some graph here, f of x. We've got these vertical lines, x equals a, and we've got this vertical line, x equals b. David, what's the thing that we forgot? The x-axis. And the reason that you need the x-axis is without the x-axis, how much area is under the curve from a to b? All of it. All of it. This like infinitely long strip would be all of it. So you need trapped, bounded area. We need all the stuff. Is everybody okay? Aaron, you're good? Okay. So yesterday, all the problems that we looked at were either parent functions that you knew really well and therefore were friendly, or it was a graph that I put together that was like rectangles, triangles, trapezoids, all the things. That's not always going to be the case. That was like the case for yesterday. Polymon, if I can get you to go back and you're going to drive the laptop for a little bit. And Polymon, I really missed you last night. I kept telling my wife Polymon's coming by. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I had my baseball bat and everything. I was so ready for you to show up uninvited at my house. All right, so on your calculators, please, I need you to evaluate for me the integral from 0 to 4, square root 64 minus x squared dx, meaning I need you to find the area bounded by that graph, the x-axis, from 0 to 4. Give me a good approximation. Either do this on the calculate screen, and what are the steps there? It's menu, calculus, numerical integral, and then as soon as you do that, like the template shows up and you pop everything in. The other option, anybody doing it on the graph screen? Helen's doing it on the graph screen, right? You're going to graph the square root of 64 minus x squared, which if you graph it, you see it's a semicircle. And then on, remind me, Helen, on the graph screen, it's menu. 
menu analyze graph and then it's integral and then it asks for like a lower bound and an upper bound or does it say left bound and right bound? Lower bound. Okay, lower bound is zero, upper bound is four. Ile, what are you getting for your approximation? Uh, 30.6116. 30.6116. How many guys are getting 30.6116? Lewis, you okay with 30.6116? That looks like no, or it's the slowest yes I've ever heard. 30.6116. Andrew, you get him help help out. Everybody good? We know what the value is. Now there will come a time where you will be able to calculate that answer with even greater levels of precision because of the calculus skills that you have. Now is not that time. Now is the time to pop it into the calculator, have the calculator do the work, and we go from there. Everybody okay? All right, so here's what we're gonna do. With our friend Geometry Sketchpad, we're gonna go down the road that our friend um, George Riemann, God rest his soul, took us down. This was like his thing. This was his baby. What, what Riemann said is, okay, here's the graph of square root of 64 minus x squared, and I think you guys have this in the handout from yesterday. A is at 0, B is at 4, and that's the area that I want to estimate. I want to estimate this area over here. What Riemann said is this, well, is the shaded area a region that I know? Is that like a, a, a shape that I know the name of? No. No. It's part of a shape that I know the name of, right? Like the whole thing, like quarter circle or semicircle. But I don't have a quarter circle, I have like a part of a circle. This is a problem. So what Riemann said is he said, if I'm going to go from 0 to 4, okay, here comes my like emphasizing the vocab here, I'm going to partition the interval. The word partition, P-A-R-T-I-T-I-O-M, just means chop it up. I'm going to chop up the interval from 0 to 4 into smaller intervals that we're going to call sub-intervals. Okay? Now, I'm going to do this in what we're going to call a uniform way, meaning each of the sub-intervals is going to have the same width. I'm just trying to get all the vocab out. Here we go. So these are going to be uniform sub-intervals. So if I said let's take the interval 0 to 4 and partition it into uniform sub-intervals, let's say I want to use four sub-intervals. How long is each sub-interval going to be? You're going to have a, a length of one, right? Now what he said is there's a lot of ways I can do this. So for example, let's show the right rectangles. So show right rectangles, how long? Okay, and if you take a look at what's going on here. So he said I'm going to go from 0 to 4 and I'm going to partition, I'm going to chop my interval, chop, 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 into four rectangles. Each rectangle, now there's ways I could do this, we're going to call this the right endpoint method because we're going to use the right endpoint. We're going to go up to the curve. Wherever I hit the curve, come on over, go down. That's going to be my first rectangle. For the second interval, right endpoint, up to the curve, over down. Third one. Fourth one. Everybody okay with what's happening here? We're covering this region with rectangles. Now, which method again? Right. The right endpoint method. The name of the method tells you how to build the rectangle. So on this particular sub-interval, you go to the right endpoint, you go up to the curve, over, down. Now in this case, overestimate or underestimate? Underestimate. Uh-oh, I heard over and I heard under. Under. Lewis, over or under? Under. Under, tell me why under. Because you're going, because uh, you're missing some space in the top. Right, on this first rectangle, I'm going to go up, and I'm going to go over, and I'm going to come on down, and what I'm missing is this little piece that's over here, and the second one, this little piece, that little piece, that little piece. Everybody good? So we've got an underestimate. Now, thanks to the magic of Geometry Sketchpad, I can see that the estimate is 29.812. Geometry Sketchpad thinks the real answer is 30.390. 
So clearly an underestimate. A pretty good underestimate, like pretty good. Not exact. In fact, our calculator is telling us something different. And the reason that the calculator tells us something different, Geometry Sketchpad has some precision issues that your calculator doesn't. Calculator is going to give you the best answer. Everybody okay? Now, my question for you all is, and this is what Riemann did, how do you make the estimate better? Talk to somebody near you. How would you make this estimate better? So what I heard in all the conversations is if I want to make a better estimate, more rectangles. Meaning you're going to take your interval and you're going to, fancy word here, partition into more subintervals. If you're going to do more subintervals, well, guess what? They're going to be narrower. Right? You're going to go up just a little bit, you're going to go over, you're going to come back down, and you're going to add up all those areas and you're going to get your estimate. Everybody good? Now, if you really want to be impressed by Riemann, he did this in the 1860s. You know when the first cap cap uh, graphing calculators came out? Yes, Not the 1860s. <laughs> he did this without Geometry Sketchpad, without the benefit of a graphing calculator. He did all of this by hand because that's what they were doing back in the day. And because I have such high expectations for you all, I'm thinking okay. we're not going to do that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right, well, <laughs> you're like, I'm, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> send, me, I'm out send me to some other course, I'm out, I'm out. All right, now here's the thing. For some reason, I don't actually see the shading happening over here. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, so let's try a different method. We've got the right rectangles. Uh, Polymon, show Let's click on hide right rectangles. Hide right rectangles. Hide them. There you go. <laughs> show left rectangles. Okay, so now we've got the left rectangles. What's the difference here? Overestimate. Now we've got an overestimate. I'm still going from A to B. I'm still partitioning my interval into four regions. But now with each sub-interval, I use the left end point, I go up to the curve, I go over, I go down. I go up, I go over, I go down. The name of the method tells you how to find the area. Aaron, you good? Mm -hmm. All right. Now there's two other methods that I want you to know about. One of them, we've talked about the left end point method. We've talked about the right end point method. Riemann had another idea. He said, well, why, why bother with the left or the right if you could also do midpoints? So before I show you anything, before Polymon does anything, have a quick conversation. Midpoint method. What are you going to do with the midpoint method? Trust your instincts here. So within one of the seven rows, All right. All right, Palamon, let's hide that left rectangle, show midpoints, and what I heard from pretty much all the friends, if you're going to go from 0 to 4 with four rectangles and you're going to use the midpoint method, you've determined the width of each rectangle is 1, and then how do you determine the height of the rectangle? With the midpoint method, how are we going to determine the height of the rectangle? You're going to go to the midpoint of that subinterval. You're going to use that midpoint, you're going to go up to the curve to determine the height of the rectangle, and you're going to multiply the value of the function there by the width of the subinterval. So for the next subinterval, which goes from 1 to 2, you use the midpoint. You guys know what the midpoint is. Midpoint is going to be 1.5. The way you determine the height of the rectangle in this subinterval, you go up to 1.5 find f of 1.5, go left and right, and so on and so on. For those of you that can see the graph, you might see the benefit of the midpoint method. Anybody see the benefit of the midpoint method? It's more precise? Why do you think we're more precise? Because now that I see all the different Right? Like it's, I think it's clearest with this fourth rectangle. There's a little bit of area that I'm missing, 
but then there's a little bit of area that I'm capturing that I'm not supposed to capture. Like one of the benefits of the midpoint method is, depending on the curve, you're like taking into account this overestimate and the underestimate at the same time. Okay. And if I want to get a better estimate, you guys know how this works. More, more rectangles. More rectangles. Always more rectangles. That's going to be the way that we're going to do this. Okay, Palmone. One last time. Hide midpoint. Last one. Show trapezoids. The trapezoids, I already heard some like oohing and aahing there. <laughs> there is a reason why the trapezoids are powerful. And although you might really like left endpoint method or right endpoint method or midpoint method, look at the graph. Four trapezoids. Look at the, like what Geometry Sketchpad thinks the true area is. Look at the estimate. They're almost identical. Four trapezoids gets you an answer that is different by less than five one hundredths. It is a really powerful way to go about doing this, especially if you're going to have to do this by hand. Everybody good? All right, the rest of this period is going to be very calculator active. I want to get you guys like comfortable with doing this so that tonight's homework is really good. Polymone, you have done a great job for God and country. You can come on back. And you guys could turn to page 11. They said no. They're just jealous. I will take you. Okay, they're a very welcoming group. Just don't talk to Giselle, and she'll be. We'll all be fine. Oh. Or I lay. You can talk to David. Because why not? All right. Can I get some really brave, strong soul who's willing to read the introduction, and then whenever you're tired of reading, call on somebody else. David, whenever you get tired of reading or we get tired of listening, pass it to somebody else. <coughs> Uh, motivating women. So. Yep. George Friedman. Friedman. Women. He died young. If you don't think 40 is young, ask somebody who's over 40. It's young. The method that you need for determining the exact area bound by function of events and the excessive over an area of A, B, Today we are going to continue down the same road that we traveled over 150 years ago. This idea was important enough to estimate the area bounded between a function and x axis over an interval. Divide the interval into smaller sections called position. Then create known geometric shape to estimate the area of the smaller interval. Then find the sum of the area to get more accurate answers. Alright, call somebody else. Luis. How small is the last one? Infinitely, infinitely small. Infinitely. Okay, that's not the word infinitely. Infin infin <laughs> it's infinite and then it's got some stuff. And it's not infinite smiley, it's infinitesimally small. Oh, okay, what's the word for everybody? Infinitesimally. Teeny tiny. Anybody ever watch the movie Aladdin? Yes. yes. Right? Aladdin, the genie comes out of the bottle and he's like, co colossal cosmic powers. Yeah, you can do it in space. Oh, yeah. That's what we're thinking about here. All right, keep going, Lois. <laughs> As the length of the sub intervals becomes smaller, the number of intervals must become larger and larger and larger and larger. How large is the large last one? Infinitely large. <laughs> Your final result will be the exact value of the definite integral. Integral. Wow, if this wasn't impressive enough, <laughs> he did all of this without a graphic calculator. Excellent. All right. So here's where here's where we are. Um, we're gonna look at this function four x squared e to the negative x plus two on the interval zero six. I do not expect any one of you knows what that graph looks like. That's not the point. This isn't a friendly function. It's graphed for you over here, and as you can see. This is not going to be the kind of thing that you can chop up into regions where like it's rectangles and triangles. You've got curves. Curves are going to be tricky for us. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the exact value using a variety of techniques. We're going to use the left endpoint method, the right endpoint method, the midpoint method, the trapezoid method. We're going to start to see some shortcuts that Riemann figured out that you guys will figure out. What I want you to do first is get that function graphed on your calculator, please. Once you've got it graphed, get me your estimate. Aaron, how do you 
do you feel about driving the uh, graphing tackle there? You get a license. All right, Celeste, what are you getting for your decimal approximation? 19.504. 19.504, can I get some confirmation on this? Yes. 19.504? 4502. Great. Getting the calculator to give you the answer is good and easy. Aaron, if I can get you back onto the calculator. And if you could first graph the function, and we're gonna we're gonna go through the process. And I have a feeling you guys are gonna take to this really well. I hope so too. <laughs> so it's 4x squared. 4 Yeah, 4x squared times you have to put in that multiplication dot e e to the negative x. Okay. Plus 2. So arrow over. You could just Okay, there we go. So I want to go from 0 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All right, Andrew, for part A, what method are we using? Part A? Uh huh. Or that, that first one that we're doing? Where it says model 1. Um, the midpoint method. Okay, so we've got to identify the method. We've got the midpoint method. Give me more. Uh, did I tell you anything else in the problem? I hope I did more than just say midpoint method. Um, you divide into four partitions of equal width. Okay, four partitions of equal width. All right, I think that should be enough. If we're going to go from 0 to 6, here's the A value, there's the B value, and I want to use, I want to be really specific here, four partitions of equal width, how wide is each interval going to be? 3 over 2. If you're not sure, think about it, you're going from 0 to 6. Yeah. I need four partitions, so I need to chop this into four pieces. They're each going to be equal in width, so I'm going to chop it, I'm going to chop it, I'm going to chop it. Some folks do a little side calculation, and they say, okay, 6 minus 0 over 4, which is 1.5. That means my first interval starts at 0, ends at 1.5. The next one goes from 1.5 to 3. The next one goes from 3 to 4.5, and the last one ends at 6. You guys okay back there? Okay, now here's where we've got to be careful. We've identified the partition, we've got the sub-intervals, what's the method? Midpoint. The method is the midpoint method. So if I'm going to go from 0 to 6 using the midpoint method, you might say, oh, well, here I've chopped it at 1.5, at 3, at 4.5, and 6. The mistake would be to say, the mistake would be to forget the method. If I'm going to build a rectangle and I'm going to use the midpoint method, the most important value here is the midpoint. And the midpoint is going to have to be? 0.75. Should be 0.75. So 0.75 is the midpoint of this first subinterval, the midpoint for the next subinterval between 1.5 and 3. 2.25 between the next two is 3.75. And the last one is. 5.25. I'll save you guys a little bit of embarrassment there. No. Nope. <laughs> okay. I don't remember that. So here's the thing, and we're not going to draw the pictures all the time, but I think they're helpful in the beginning. It's this little green tick mark here at 0 0.75 that is going to I'm going to use to determine the height of the rectangle. So at 0.75, I'm going to go up to the curve. And I need to make a rectangle. So I'm going to go like to the left and to the right to cover 
that whole interval of 0 to 1.5. I use the midpoint to determine the height of the rectangle, but I already know the width of the rectangle has to be 1.5. Is everybody okay with that? So I'm going to do it again on the next one, which is at 2.25, go up. That determines the height of the rectangle. Next one, go up, make my rectangle. Go up, make the rectangle. I have a total of one, two, three, four rectangles that we're going to consider. My approximation, and this is only an approximation, is going to be the total of all those four areas. Well, the way I'm going to find the area for each rectangle, for the first rectangle, I need to know how wide, right, the width of the interval. And I need to know how tall, which is going to be determined by the value of the function at the midpoint. Is everybody okay with the geometry there? Every rectangle, find the width, how wide. Uh-oh. How wide is that rectangle? Oh, 1.5. 1.5, how tall? Oh, you have to plug in 0.75 back to the original. Right, what I need is I need to evaluate the function at 0 0.75. Riemann would have had to do that by hand. We don't have to do this by hand. And Aaron, I'm going to ask you to start doing the calculations. So if you could get off the graph and go over to the calculate screen. So this first rectangle has a width of 1.5 and it has a height of f of 0.75. Carmen, how about that second rectangle? How wide, how tall? How wide is 1.5? 1.5, how tall? Then you have to plug in 2.25. Right, I'm going to evaluate the function at 2.25 because it's the midpoint method. Palamon, how about that third rectangle? That third rectangle, how wide is it? How tall is it? It's the same width. It's the same width of 1.5. How tall? It's 3.75. Now I want to be careful. It's not 3.75. 3.75 is a part of how you're going to find the height. You need to evaluate the function at 3.75. Okay, so it's the width times the value of the function at the midpoint. And Celeste, how about that last rectangle? Um, 1.5 times f of 3.75. Uh, One point five times f of 5.25. The width of each rectangle is the same. That shouldn't be a surprise. We built it that way. We said a uniform partition. F of 0.75, I don't need to know it by in my head. I can get it out of my calculator f of 2.25, f of 3.75, f of 5.25. Now, Aaron is doing a great job in the back, and here's the thing for everybody that's watching at home or in the class. I want you to go to your calculator and type this in in one step. What I don't need to see is that you figured out f of 0.75 and that you figured out f of 2.25. I need to see this work, and then the only thing I care about next, what's it equal to? or what's it approximated by. So you're going to get really good at the typing here. 1.5 times F1, because you've already called the function F1. Just keep going. Let's see what we get. 1.5 F1 of 2.25. Seven, five. You guys are going to get really good with these moves. We're going to do them a lot. Plus 1.5, F1, 5.25, and what do we get? 19.6479. How many guys are getting 19.6479? We're good. So approximately 19.6479. Now, here's what I think can be a little bit of a pain in the butt. You did a lot of thinking over here to like come up with the area expression, and then it was just a whole lot of typing to get over here. So if there are things that you see that maybe make life a little bit easier, and they're legal, feel free to do them. Carmen, what do you see that would make life a little bit easier? Um, 
you can take out the 1.5 interest. Like take out, throw it away? Oh, no, just factor <laughs> out. Factor out the 1.5, is that legal? Yeah. Right, because they all have the same width of 1.5. So easier might be to say 1.5 and then parentheses, f of 0.75 plus f of 2.25 plus f of 3.75 plus f of 5.25, close the parentheses. Answer is not going to change. Okay, in terms of where points are going to be awarded, I am probably going to award points first for like determining how wide each rectangle is supposed to be. And then I'm going to look at your setup and say, okay, are they using everything correctly? And then honestly, the numerical answer is like one more little point. That's, that's honestly about it. Everybody good? All right, we're going to do this in slightly a different order than it appears in the packet. If you guys could go over to the partner practice, I'm really interested to see what you can do with method number three. Aaron, if you can stay where you are, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to switch you off so you can do the work over there. Okay. Um, it's on the very next page, method three. So for friends over here, okay, we're going from zero to six. We already know what that answer is, right? So there are 19.504. Okay, so we're going from zero to six. And Lewis, what method this time? No, right endpoint. Right endpoint method. And then the next question you need to ask yourself is, how many rectangles? I'm gonna go from zero to six with the right endpoint method. Three rectangles. First question, how wide is each rectangle? That, that should be the easy part, right? So you can partition the interval, you're gonna go, I'm going from zero to six, so like zero to six, chop it, chop it. Zero, two, four, and six are the cut points. And then I need to know about the width of the first rectangle and the height of the first rectangle. How wide is that first rectangle? Two. Two, how tall is it? It's four? It's like exactly four? Oh. Now remember, I don't actually need to know the value of the function at that point. I just need to know how do I find the height. Okay, so all of you guys doing this one. It looks like most people are done now. Okay. The things that you have to, have to, have to pay attention to, oh my god, you have to pay attention to, is what's the... Uh, What's the interval? In this case, we're still going from 0 to 6, right? We're going from 0 to 6. The partition says right endpoint method, and it says three rectangles. So I'm going to cut 0, 2, 4, and 6. The area is going to be approximately width of the first rectangle times the height. If I'm using the right endpoint method, f of 2, 2 times f of 4, 2 times f of 6. How many guys have this as your setup? One person out of 11? Oh, two I people? Maybe three people? Two. You what? Alright, you factored out the 2. We love it. You guys learn quickly. So you could have factored out the 2 because the 2 is equal in all of those, so it's a common factor. And according to Aaron, oh, he's doing it right now. 
Nineteen point eight three. No, three eight nine. Three eight nine. Nineteen point three eight nine. Let's see if we got nineteen point three eight nine. How many guys have nineteen point three eight nine? We've got this under control. All right, good. So now for the push. Now for the push. Let's do method number two. We're going to do the trapezoid method. What I want you to do is have a conversation with the folks that are near you. Take them through the process. What are you going to do? What does this look like? And Aaron, I think we're done projecting on what's on the computer. So if you want to come on back. So method number two for trapezoids of equal width. So give me a quick sketch of what this is going to look like. Be careful. mistakes that you made right out of the box? Uh, I didn't read Right, you have to pay attention. You have to look at those endpoints. You're going to go from 1 to 6. So if I'm starting over here at x equals 1, and I'm going all the way over to x equals 6, okay, next thing I need to know, I've got my interval. Check. Next thing, what method? Okay, trapezoids. Next important thing, how many? Four. And I don't know that I emphasized the word enough earlier. I keep saying four like trapezoids of equal width. In the text and sometimes on the exam they're going to say a uniform partition, meaning uniform just meaning equal. It doesn't have to be equal. They'll tell you when it's supposed to be equal. We are going to do some problems where the chopping up is not done into equal portions. We're going to call that a non-uniform partition. Don't worry, when the time's right, we'll get there. So my first question for you guys is how wide is each trapezoid going to be? We're going from, five, from 1 to 6. The width has to be 1.25. So some people say, okay, delta x is going to be 6 minus 1 over 4, 1.25. So when I do my partitioning, I start at 1, and this, this interval ends at 2.25. Then we go from 2.25 over to 3.5. From 3.5, we're going to go over to 4.75. And from 4.75, we go all the way over to 6, and we end it in the right place. Good, I know we're moving in the right direction. Okay, now we've got to make the trapezoids. Now, the tricky part with the trapezoid is you actually wind up using both sides, right? You go up, determine the height. You go up, determine the height. Make a trapezoid. Make a trapezoid. Make a trapezoid. Make a trapezoid. I've got a total of one, two, three, four trapezoids. You need to pay attention and make sure that you know the area formula for a trapezoid. Area for a uh, trapezoid. Myra, what do you have for the area of trapezoid? Um, yep. Just in general, the area of trapezoid. Base 1 plus base 2 times the height. And make sure that the most important thing with these bases, they're parallel. They have to be parallel, and the perpendicular, the perpendicular is the height. So let's see if we can do this together. So this integral of 1 to 6, and I'll just call my function f of x dx, 
I'm going to approximate by finding these four areas. Area for the first trapezoid is going to be one half. How long is the first base? I'm not looking for a number, I'm looking for a process. David? I will have to be bringing it back to the uh, formula, so it's going to be f of 1. It's going to be f of 1. That's the first base, right? First base. Length of the second base? is f of 2.25. 2.25 is the x, what I need is the y coordinate, the value of the function. So f of 1, f of 2.25, 1 half, base 1 plus base 2, don't stop. What's the height? The height, right, and I think this is the thing that always messes me up with the trapezoids, especially this way, if these are the bases, that length there is the height. Are all the friends okay with the setup? Mm. All right, let's get some hands in this. Somebody give me the second one. What's that second one going to have to be? Lewis, what you got? <coughs> Plus one half. Plus one half. Length of the first base? F of 2.25. F of 2.25. Plus F of 3.5. Plus F of 3.5 times? 1.25. 1.25. Andrew, how about that third rectangle? Uh, trapezoid. Mm, it'll be plus of a one half. <laughs> plus a half. Um, F of 3.5. F of 3.5. Um, plus F um, 4.75 times 1.25. Times 1.25, and I lay, how about that last trapezoid? Uh, one, one half, plus one half. One half. Times f of 4.75 plus f of 6 times 1.25. Times 1.25. That has got to be at least a two-point setup. Now, here's the thing. You guys could type this into your calculator and be done, and we have great typers in the room. But I'm really interested to see what mathematical cleverness exists in the room to make your life easier. So take a minute, talk to the folks around you. What could you do to make this whole process a little bit faster? Legal things that you could do to make your life better. So I heard I can factor out the half. I heard I can factor out the 1.25. So that means you've got a half times 1.25. Now what's left? You took out the half. You took out the 1.25. What's left? No, 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 no. There's something special here. What's left? F of 1. F of 1. Plus 2F of 2.25. Okay, plus F of 2.25, right? That's this guy here. And then there's actually two of these, right? Because you took out the half, you took out the 1.25. Look, now you've got another F of 2.25 here. So I could say take that in, double it, plus F of 3.5. I can double that because it shows up again in the next one. Plus F of 4.75, and I can double that. Plus F of 6. Stephen, you okay there? Good. It's like you're having deep thoughts. F of 6, double that? No. F of 6 is not getting doubled in this case. Right, and the reason why f of 6 doesn't get doubled, you're talking about like this very last trapezoid, this one base over here, because there's not another trapezoid coming up, you don't use that base again. You use the first base one time, you use the last base one time, and all the ones in between get doubled. Did anybody come up with the numerical value for this? Uh -huh. Five eighths. Five eighths. That's what don't that think for. so. <laughs> The numerical answer there. 18? 16.86. I think it's 16.861. Right, it's not going to be in the neighborhood of 19 because we're using a different subinterval. So 16.861.
Okay, two nights homework is just some practice with Riemann sums. It's the assignment for lesson number 70 in the problem set packet. Now here are the mistakes your peers have made in the past. They jumped straight to the final number answer and turned that in. Oh my God, read the directions. I have to see the setups in all of these. You're gonna get some practice typing into the calculator. Read the intervals carefully, read the process carefully, make sure you're answering the right questions. See you guys later. No one's going to eat one, huh? I'm gone. What class do you have next? Oh, English. Can you Thank you.